Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Bob Golden, the Dean of the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. I work very closely with my partner, Dr. Alan Kaplan, who is the Chief Executive Officer of UW Health, where I also serve as a chair of the board. Tonight, we're kicking off a really exciting new series called Wisconsin Medicine. We hope the series provides you with an insider's look at some exciting advancements in healthcare that are all made possible by the exciting research that goes on in the School of Medicine and Public Health. Our goal with this series is to skate where the proverbial puck will be in terms of the future of research and the healthcare improvements that come out of it. A new era of medicine is definitely on the horizon and it's happening right here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Through this Wisconsin Medicine live stream, we will share with you the latest breakthroughs emerging from the amazing partnership that exists between UW Health and the UW School of Medicine and Public Health. In tonight's inaugural installment, Taking Down Cancer Through Tech, we're gonna showcase some of that innovative and collaborative technology that plays such an important role in the future of cancer research and ultimately, and more importantly, in the future of patient care. To start us off, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Howard Bailey, who is the director of the UW Carbone Cancer Center, also the Andy and Susan North Professor of Cancer Research and the Associate Dean for Oncology, the School of Medicine and Public Health. As a clinician, Howard is nationally renowned as an expert in the area of chemo prevention, which is the development of nutrients and medications for the prevention and when necessary, the treatment of cancer. He serves as the principal investigator of the UW Chemo Prevention Consortium and has led or participated in more than 100 clinical trials, all examining different aspects of preventing or treating cancer. Welcome, Howard. Thank you, Dr. Tonight, you will hear from three cancer researchers who exemplify a key tenet of the UW Carbone Cancer Centers, which is applying University of Wisconsin cancer research to benefit patients with cancer. Next. The University of Wisconsin has an incredible rich history of impactful cancer research discovery, which has benefited patients around the globe. Here are just some of the examples, starting with Mohs surgery in the 1930s through tomotherapy in recent years. Next. The cancer research you will hear about highlights the themes that follow. A hallmark of cancer research at the UW Carbone Cancer Center and all innovative healthcare of Wisconsin medicine is the incorporation of the wide ranging research strengths of the UW campus. The application of UW research to patients as quickly as possible, and that our cancer research should not only benefit local patients, but patients throughout Wisconsin, the nation, and beyond, which embodies the Wisconsin idea. Next. Another theme tonight is precision cancer therapy. Historically, and still present today, many cancer patients are treated based on their cancer type, whereas precision or personalized treatment is making treatment decisions based on unique changes in each individual's cancer cells. Given the novelty and complexity of precision therapy, you will hear more about our Carbone-sponsored Precision Medicine Molecular Tumor Board, developed by Drs. Burkhardt and Deming, which incorporates UW technology and research into providing free consultation to cancer physicians and their patients from all over Wisconsin. Next. Previously, the only way to examine the individual characteristics of a person's tumor was obtaining a piece of it through invasive procedures. Here's an example of UW innovation, which enables much of our current precision cancer therapy research through a procedure called liquid biopsies. While some institutions try to accomplish finding cancer cells in our circulating blood with room-sized machines, as shown on the left, Dr. David Beebe, a biomedical engineer, and Dr. Josh Lang, a physician scientist, can find one cancer cell out of billions of cells with the simple elegance of microfluidics and a finger-sized glass machine as shown on the right. Next. In general, precision therapy allows us to better predict 
a particular therapy's effectiveness through understanding of individual tumor mutations. Our first two speakers will show you how we are further improving upon the accuracy of selecting the correct precision cancer therapy for our patients. Dr. Melissa Scala has established technology to literally examine an individual tumor cell. Dr. Mark Burkhardt has used genomic technology and good old fashioned clinical data to examine how and why some patients do much better than expected. Next. Analogous to precision therapy is immunotherapy. Just like the first bone marrow transplant performed here many years ago, cancer immunology is a key aspect of our work. Whether that's the development of novel cancer attacking antibodies or vaccines as shown, or the ultimate personalized cancer therapy, enhancing our own immune cells to better eradicate cancer. Dr. Jacques Galopou, a physician scientist, is going to describe his groundbreaking research into using our own cells to treat cancer. Next. In closing, the cancer research and care at the UW Carbone Cancer Center continues to benefit from a legacy of world-changing cancer research, the availability and application of incredible UW technology, and impactful precision cancer therapy research. But ultimately, the most important component is the great staff, providers, and researchers of Wisconsin Medicine and the Carbo Cancer Center, of which our speakers to follow wonderfully illustrate. Next. As always, we are very grateful for your time and interest in On Wisconsin. Thank you so much, Howard. Now it's really a pleasure to introduce Dr. Melissa Scala, who is a professor of biomedical engineering at the Morgridge Institute for Research and also a member of our Carbone Cancer Center. Melissa's expertise is in cancer and specifically in primary tumor organoids, mouse models, multi-photon and fluorescent lifetime microscopy, optical coherence tomography, second harmonic microscopy, optical spectroscopy, and nanotechnology. <laughs> there is not going to be a quiz at the end asking you to repeat all of that or to spell it. Her ongoing projects involve active collaborations and mentorship of learners from diverse backgrounds, bringing together medicine, engineering, and science with real synergies. Welcome, Melissa. Thank you. It's exciting to be here. I'm glad that Howard introduced the concept of precision medicine because that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, and I am an engineer, but I promise I won't give any equations in this uh, presentation. <laughs> okay, uh, so next slide, please. Yeah. So as Howard mentioned, you know, the idea of, of matching a patient with the optimal treatment is actually a complex decision-making process. There can be hundreds of potential drugs for one type of tumor. And we have to ask questions like how effective is each drug? How toxic is each drug? Which drugs do we combine for the greatest synergy? And we also have to consider long-term effects. So we have a few um, pieces of information for each cancer. We know the type of cancer. We might know things like uh, receptor status or a few other things. So we can pick a treatment. And what we do now is an iterative process where we try one treatment. We wait weeks or months and we see, did the tumor grow or shrink? How is the patient feeling? And then we change the treatment plan if needed. Um, so uh, next slide, please. What I think of right now is that we have something like a compass. So we have an idea of the direction to go with each cancer patient. And we know we can walk, say, towards the west if we want to get from the Memorial Union to the Carbone Cancer Center. But we don't have something as precise as a map. And so that's my goal as an engineer is to provide the tools that can get us from this kind of compass thing to a more precise map so we know exactly what to do for the next patient. Uh, next slide, please. So what are we doing in my lab in collaboration with oncologists at the Cancer Center is we're taking samples from patients, either a surgical sample or a biopsy, and then we're growing those samples in the lab. So that's what the tumor organoid is. It's basically a tumor in a dish. 
So those are little macro suspensions of the tumor that are grown in this kind of gel, like a jello mold. That's what Dusty likes to call them, my collaborator. And then we pour this sort of sugar juice on top that helps keep those cells growing as they would in the body. So what we're trying to do is fool those tumor cells into growing as they would in the body. And the magic here is that this lets us replicate those samples from one patient into multiple different wells so we can try multiple different treatment options on each person's cancer. So what I've done in my lab is develop these optical imaging techniques where we can see this glowing light from the cells. And that's what you see on the right there, the individual molecules in the cells that give off light and tell us how are the cells responding to treatment. And the key there is that we can do this very rapidly. So we can get information in a clinically relevant time frame so we can tell physicians what might work for treatment of the patient. Uh, next slide, please. So the phenomenon we're using is called fluorescence. So you might have heard of this. This is when you shine light on a molecule and you get light of a different color. So you might see this, you know, jellyfish do this. If you go to the geology museum on the UW campus, you'll see rocks that do this. Um, so it turns out there's molecules in our body that do this, NADH and FAD, and these are metabolic coenzymes. So what that means is that they're involved in reactions that produce energy in the cell. And this is so important in cancer because that energy creates the molecules to, to create new cells, to grow the cancer. And so that's a really key piece of information that those molecules are giving us. So what you see on the bottom are the images we can get in these microscopes just from the natural fluorescence that's coming out of those molecules in your cells in your body. Um, so we can see, for example, on the left, there are some really bright cells and those cells are producing a lot of energy. If you look on the right, there's different colored cells and that tells us what specific pathways the cells are using to create energy. So they're making these subtle differences in the way they adapt to drug treatment. Uh, okay, next slide, please. So Howard mentioned the Precision Medicine Molecular Tumor Board, and I think this is just a phenomenal, beautiful program. And it's a good um, representative program of the Wisconsin idea. And the reason I like this so much, actually, I talk about this at universities you know, across the globe, and people are always impressed with this program because it's pretty unique. So you can refer yourself as a patient, your physician can refer you, and you can get a biopsy and a genomic report. So that report tells us what gene alterations occur in your cancer. And then super smart people like Dusty and Mark, you'll hear from Mark later, review this genomic report and then make a recommendation. They might find that there's a genetic modification that makes you a really good candidate for a clinical trial. Or perhaps, you know, there's a drug we wouldn't normally use for your type of cancer, but your genomic report indicates it would be a very good drug for you. Um, so I collaborate with both Mark and Dusty, and I obtain samples through these uh, Precision Medicine Molecular Tumor Board um, patients and grow organoids and then perform my optical tests to provide even more information. So genomic reports are fantastic and they give us information about what might work for a patient, but they're again just a compass. So we want to provide this map. So that's why we're working together to provide more information for each of these patients. Uh, Okay, so what we've done um, here is just shown a few examples of the cancers we've looked at with the Precision Medicine Molecular Tumor Board. So the top row is just the untreated organoids. We wanna know how are they creating energy under the best circumstances. So pancreatic cancer, breast cancer, neuroendocrine tumors, and colon cancer, you can see each of those look quite different from each other, and that's expected because cancers are quite different from each other. Uh, then if you look at the bottom row, you can see what happens if we treat with one example drug. So we'll usually pick, you know, a handful of drugs to try in these drug screens based on our best guess about what would be the best treatment option for these patients. Um, and you can see, for example, in the pancreatic cancer, the shape of that organoid has changed. That tells me maybe this is a good candidate. Maybe the, the drug would work well in this patient. In the breast cancer, you can see that the color of the cells has changed. And that tells me that they're adapting to the drug by using different metabolic pathways. And perhaps that means that patient would respond to this treatment as well. Um, and then you have additional examples with neuroendocrine tumors and colon cancer. So, so far with Dusty and Mark, we have screened uh, dozens of patients with this um, microscopy technique, and we've then followed them and seen that we're pretty good at actually predicting how they will respond to treatment. So we need to do some more research, but we're very excited about what we're learning here. 
Um, the unique part is that it's a single cell level measurement, so we can provide very specific information on single cell response to treatment. So that's unique for our technology. Okay, last slide, please. Um, so in the future, what I'm really hoping is that we can move away from this compass, provide a more specific map of what we can do to treat cancer patients so that we can give them the best drugs for their tumor while reducing toxicities, improving quality of life, all those things we want to do for our patients in Wisconsin. Um, and uh, it's been just a great pleasure working with the fantastic physicians at the Carbone Cancer Center. It's incredibly enriching and um, I hope to do more of it soon. So I'll, I'll take your questions at the end. We have two more wonderful speakers. So thank you. Thank you so much. That was wonderful, Melissa. And a great introduction for our next speaker, Dr. Mark Burkhardt, who is the Associate Director of Genomics and Precision Medicine at the Carbone Cancer Center. Dr. Burkhardt is a breast oncologist a faculty member in the Division of Hematology, Oncology, and Palliative Care in the school's Department of Medicine. And he's also the chair of the Precision Medicine Molecular Tumor Board that Melissa just uh, referred to. This is such a wonderful example of cutting edge science um, in the tradition of the Wisconsin idea. So uh, Mark, thank you so much for joining us, welcome. It's a pleasure to be here tonight, and and thank you, and 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 thanks for Dr. Scala for that great introduction uh, as well. Um, so what we've learned over the past uh, years uh, is we now have the tools to peer into the DNA of each and every person's cancer, and when we do that, we see a tremendous variety in the gene mutations that drive cancer. And if you do that on 10,000 different cancers of different types, you see many different genes that are mutated. So this shows on the far left that a gene called TP53 is mutated in about a third of cancers. And a gene called PIK3CA, which is the next gene down, it's actually a little below that area, is found mutated in about 12% of cancers. But then the interesting part of this whole thing is that there's a very long tail of genes that are found mutated in only a small fractions of cancers. And these can be very profoundly helpful for patients if we can find them. Next slide, please. Um, so because of that insight, uh, Dr. Deming and I started a few years ago uh, the Precision Medicine Molecular Tumor Board to uh, identify the gene mutations in each patient's cancer. So patients with advanced or metastatic disease, their doctor or they can uh, submit their information and we will review them and try to make the best recommendation. And we've reviewed over the past few years uh, almost 4,000 reports from across Wisconsin. Next. And when you do that, you find uh, some amazing things and, and you profoundly help some patients. Uh, this is an interesting uh, story of someone who was, had a gene mutation that was way out on that tail of that distribution curve. This patient had a mutation in a gene called NTRK1, which is found in one in a thousand patients or 0.1% frequency. And what you're seeing down below is a picture of a CAT scan from June 2017, where there was a tumor that was the size of a soccer ball that was uh, this whole area between those three arrows, between the pelvis, the white in the bottom, and the gray liver on the top. And that made her, unfortunately, quite ill. But once we discovered that this NTRK1 fusion was there, we were able to match her to a very specific dr drug that would turn off that enzyme made by that gene. And when we did that, the tumor profoundly shrank and she was profoundly better uh, in only a few months and was on this drug for quite a long time. Now we learned from this that there's a long tail of genes that are found in unusual situations, but we also had the insight that there are unusual uh, 
cancer stories in other ways. And that was driven home to me the day I met Peg. So this is Peg. She's an advocate um, and has been very public and has allowed me to share her story. She was in the Wisconsin State Journal. I met Peg uh, in clinic one day and she told me her story. And her story was this. In 1978, she was diagnosed with breast cancer and had surgery. In 1982, this cancer was found to be metastatic. And her oncologist at that time told her that the average survival with metastatic cancer was two years. And she next told me that you know, her oncologist was Paul Carbone and uh, she, to her great surprise, outlived Dr. Carbone. And then she outlived her next oncologist. And then she got me. And I said, you know, two things. First of all, I'm not sure if you're outliving all your oncologists, I want to be your next one. But I also said that uh, there's something very unusual about you and we have to know what makes you tick. And we also uh, needed to know, you know, not just all the wonderful and unusual features that made Peg Peg, but which of them really contributed to, uh, to her long survival? Next. So we began to team up with national groups, the Metastatic Breast Cancer Alliance and Anne Lozier, the Susan Love Foundation uh, and the Research Army, the Avon Breast Cancer Crusade and our own UWCC Breast Cancer Research Advocate Network uh, and Deb Tobin in particular, and got their advice on how to reach out to other people like Peg so we could learn from as many of them po as possible of what makes people live long with metastatic cancer. Next. And we had three ideas. One was maybe it's the things they do. Two was maybe it was the treatments they got, although their contemporaries would have had access to the same treatments. Three was maybe it's the genes unique to their cancer or, or to their person outside of the cancer. So we launched a um, social media campaign that was uh, uh, national and international, in fact, and we launched it through this website called outliers.cancer.wisc.edu. And you can go there now and get information about it if, if you wish. Uh, and we allowed people to click on that button on the bottom saying participate now. And that would then lead to uh, hundreds of questions that would be asked for uh, only for people with metastatic breast cancer. And from these, uh, this survey, we were able to identify a uh, woman and a small number of men from around the US and around the world who had metastatic breast cancer, who wanted to share their story and wanted to help us learn what made some of them live so long. And we also, um, next slide, uh, had to analyze this data. Now, this got very complicated, as you can see, by the code. This is code in a software program called R that I don't quite understand. But I was able to recruit this very uh, smart UW undergraduate uh, who uh, got her degree in math and statistics and who has just gone off to do a data science master's degree at NYU this week. And she generated this uh, code, the software in this in R to analyze this data and generate graphs. This is one example of the graph she generated. And what this shows is uh, how long people lived with their cancer. And as you can see, there's a bunch of horizontal lines. The top line starts at 1985, which means the person there was originally diagnosed uh, at that time and has been alive with the cancer since that time. And as you can see, there are uh, at least 100 people here who've lived with their cancer since at least 2000. So what we began to ask is what makes these people tick? What makes them different than everyone else? And uh, Hank Jolly also did this analysis. She made correlations, which don't always show cause, but she looked at the things they do and the people who had breast surgery or participated in research uh, were correlated with longer survival. Obesity was a small correlation with worse uh, time with metastatic breast cancer.
But this only explained very little of the variation between individuals. So we thought more was going on here. Then uh, she turned to the treatment and what she learned was there were really two groups here. There were the exceptional responders. These are people who had a treatment and their tumors profoundly shrunk and were controlled for many years. And then there was another group who that never happened. And this was a group of people we call exceptional survivors. And they are people who lived despite their treatment where their cancer changed very slowly over time or hardly at all. And the third part that we're still working on is studying the genes that drive these cancer. We're collecting saliva and tumor samples from the longest survivors among the surveyed cohort around the country and internationally. And we're looking at uh, all 20,000 protein coding genes of their tumors and of the, that they've inherited. Next. And what we think we're gonna learn out of this uh, from the study is, first of all, we're gonna be able to answer the question, how long will I live in a more nuanced way than saying the average is two years, uh, that we will learn from Peg and others uh, more about that. And the second thing, and even more important, we hope to use some of this information to help other people become extreme survivors, even with metastatic cancer. Next, thank you. Well, thank you, Mark. Very exciting stuff. Our closing speaker this evening is Dr. Jacques Gallipo. Dr. Gallipo is the Don and Marilyn Anderson Professor of Oncology within our Department of Medicine and our Carbone Cancer Center. He is also the inaugural Associate Dean for Therapeutics Discovery and Development and the Director of our Advanced Cell Therapy Program. That program seeks to develop personalized cell therapies for immune and malignant disorders to deploy first in human clinical trials of UW cell therapy innovations, all aimed at improving outcomes for both children and adults. Welcome, Jacques. So uh, thank you, uh, Dean uh, Golden, for the uh, kind introduction. So uh, uh, UW, is an institution where cell therapy was born. Fritz Back was a 33-year-old assistant professor in 1966, and he developed a blood test that allowed for safe bone marrow transplant to take place. And one of the first successful bone marrow transplants was done in Madison in 1968. A three-year-old toddler was uh, cured with the marrow coming from his sister. So uh, since that time, this is a timeline, you see 1968, and bone marrow transplant your own or somebody else's has exploded as a curative uh, treatment uh, across the world. And it all started here 50 years ago. Uh, we went from train age to space age. In 2017, Novartis is a pharmaceutical company concluded a trial where we participated, Chris Capitini was one of the investigators, using genetically engineered immune cells, think of the Hulk, to cure leukemias that were incurable. That's the future. Big price point, but there's a lot that can be done. Uh, what separates these new technologies from the old school technologies, the old school technologies, bone marrow transplant, tissue transplant, blood transfusion, is practice of medicine. FDA is not involved in that. But if the cells or tissue are genetically engineered or modified, in the eyes of the FDA, it's now a drug. And only a handful of elite American institutions that made the leap to in essence become pharmaceutical investigative units to deploy these new technologies. Hence, uh, UW Health and the School of Medicine partnering with a cancer center to deploy a new program for advanced cell therapy. And UW Health made a substantial capital investment to build in the hospital a footprint that's like a small biotech company manufacturing investigational cell drugs that are compliant with the FDA. Not everybody in the US does this. And uh, Dean Golden spoke upon the vision. The vision is 
We want to make a difference in the lives of people by deploying new treatment for not only adults, but kids as well. That's really important. And our mission is, first and foremost, we're going to be jingoists. We want to take the discovery enterprise at UW, which is world-class, all these inventions in the cell therapy space, and to MacGyver that into first in human clinical trials. We also want to deploy best uh, practices internationally and eventually work with uh, biotech companies that want to work with us. Uh, what do we want to treat? Well, catastrophic illnesses, that's the big deal. And first and foremost amongst the catastrophic illnesses, of course, is cancer. And the Carbone Cancer Center, an NCI designated cancer center has a long track record of excellence in research. And one of the programs that uh, we're launching is, it's very straightforward. A lot of cancers, your immune system reacts to it, but ineffectively. And it needs a push. What we're doing now is the space age push. We're going to collect your own immune cells that are either within the tumor or in your bloodstream. And we're going to genetically modify them to make them uber anti-tumor cells. And you give them back to you. So it's your own cells, your own therapy. And one of the uh, indications we're pursuing inaugurally is ovarian cancer. Um, uh, Lisa Barlett is a wonderful gynoc surgeon who, who's a nationally ranked expert in ovarian cancer care. Manish is a basic scientist in this space. And we've partnered up in the idea is to collect immune cells that interact with ovarian cancer and to do something completely unnatural to those cells, which is to change your genetic makeup so they make synthetic our hormones. You can give them back to treat. We're going to be doing that in mice. That's on your top right. But the vision is clear. We want to deploy first in human studies to go to the FDA. And uh, it's not just talk. You know, you always hear uh, the doctors who made a new discovery. Okay, doc, when's the, is it going to be a treat? Oh, maybe in 10 years. No, it's now. The program was launched in 2016. Um, uh, the, the facility was launched in 2017. We got our first federal license to manufacture an investigational cell therapy that has recruited patients. 2018, 2019, and our first treated patient. And uh, this is not, I gave the example of ovarian cancer for you. But we have a whole pipeline of technologies that we're pushing out in first in human trials. And the top two lines, the top right there, that's when we have not only have a clinical trial open, but we've enrolled patient. And we are now have our fourth federal license and breaking news, we just got it Friday last week. And it's for a cancer indication. So we are manufacturing cell drugs that we were discovered here, pushing and developing, pushing that out for the benefit of our patient population. So the there is a value proposition here. And, you know, remarkable healthcare and taking out the discoveries that come out from the university and MacGyvering those into treatment will make a difference in the lives of people. So uh, you've all heard the Wisconsin idea probably 4,538 times. But what I would propose to this audience is universities knock it out of the park for discovery, historically. But the elite institutions nationally are taking ownership of those discoveries in the therapeutic space and developing it, moving it forward in partnership eventually with pharma, but taking ownership of developing it, and that is totally aligned with the Wisconsin idea. So thank you much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Gallopo. That was wonderful. We've received some questions, and people should feel free to continue to send questions in. But let's start with uh, some that have already arrived. Uh, the first one, uh, Howard. Um, I think uh, this will be good for you because I know of your involvement in leadership roles in both the uh, national and international organizations. Someone in our audience said, can you talk a bit and give some examples of collaboration 
connections between UW, the Carbo and Cancer Center, and national or international cancer research organizations. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, and the audience member, thank you for that question. So I'm going to give examples pertinent and, and related to each of uh, the speakers that you've heard from tonight, and we could give you, frankly, hundreds of others, given the size of the number of cancer researchers here at the University of Wisconsin. But we'll start with uh, Dr. Gallipo, Jacques, who just spoke, is the president of the International Society for Cell Therapy, and he can comment on a little bit better in terms of collaborating with people around the world. Melissa, who spoke earlier, uh, through the Stand Up with Cancer, which is through uh, the uh, AACR and others, uh, was elected and received one of the top prizes in her work with others around the nation related to the work that she described. Or Mark Burkhardt, who also spoke on what he's doing with the extreme survivors, he's leading one of the national and international studies where they're going to really study and explain why some people respond so well to immune type therapies looking at the genetics of their cancer. Or my own research that Bob has mentioned, in prevention, we are working with uh, institutions at the University of Vienna, institutions in South Korea, on studying new forms of how to vaccinate against cancer. So there's a lot of examples out there of where we, through the Carbon Cancer Center and Wisconsin Medicine, are working with our collaborators, both nationally and internationally. Thanks, Howard. Uh, here's one for Melissa. Can you please talk more about how your work as an engineer creates opportunities to bring together doctors and engineers and other scientists on the campus? Yes, uh, collaboration is kind of my favorite. So most of you know that the University of Wisconsin has a fantastic school of engineering and a fantastic cancer center. So it makes sense that we work together. Um, what I've appreciated since I moved here to the University of Wisconsin is that the oncologists at the Cancer Center really appreciate new tools. And if you look through the history of discovery and uh, breakthroughs in science, you'll see that most of these breakthroughs have been enabled by new tools. So I think oncologists understand this. And so they've really embraced engineers as um, collaborators who can work with them to create new measurements and understand cancer in completely new ways. So it's been uh, fantastic collaborating across different disciplines. I think that's where the magic is when you start finding new things between disciplines. Yep. Thanks. Uh, Mark, uh, here's a question for you. Are there other cancer types that are being studied with this uh, really exciting approach of looking for exceptional responders, exceptional survivors, and what we can learn from them? Well, what I'd say is coming soon. Uh, as we've done this project out of the woodwork, both from the public and patients, as well as my colleagues, uh, we've heard about other survivors with other types of cancer. And we've been interested in launching uh, studies particular to pancreatic cancer with Dr. Yupoa, uh, lung cancer with Dr. Duma, and uh, other cancers. So. Uh, this is something we'd really be interested in doing using the knowledge we've got for this initial study to do it better. Thanks. Uh, here's a question that um, is actually directed to me, although other people should feel free to, uh, to pipe in. Uh, how has the current COVID-19 pandemic uh, impacted cancer research? Well, briefly, uh, we, we have to make sure that our researchers, our students, and our staff working on uh, research across the board were safe and protected. So we did dial back uh, at the start of the epidemic, uh, almost shutting everything down except for those things that uh, involve uh, the well-being of patients. And then as quickly as we could, we have been turning it back up on stages, and we've made a lot of progress at the point now where we're, we're, we're back in gear, not just for cancer research, but for other vitally important types of research, uh, and doing it in a way that provides the safest possible environment. What I am especially worried about from a uh, public health and medicine perspective, and I'd welcome comments from our oncologists as well, is that people understandably stopped coming in for important care in the very early days of the uh, pandemic. And now that uh, UW Health uh, is back and operational, 
Uh, I'm really worried that a lot of patients, because they're afraid of coming in and maybe being exposed uh, to the virus, are, are not coming in. Uh, let me reassure you that across the Wisconsin, all health systems, not just ours, will only uh, open under safe circumstances. And I think Wisconsin has done a good job of getting in gear. What I'm really afraid of is that people are skipping their colonoscopies, their pap smears, their follow-up appointments, their mammographies, and that that can really add to another way that the vicious COVID virus is going to kill people because they are not coming in for their preventive and follow-up and um, uh, routine health care. And, you know, a couple of months uh, late is not the end of the world, but once it gets beyond that, I, I get very, uh, very nervous from a public health perspective. I don't know if uh, Mark or Howard want to uh, comment on that as well. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, I could uh, mention a little bit, uh, as uh, Dean Golden had well put it, uh, there was some initial slowdowns. Uh, things have certainly picked up from a research standpoint, and uh, maybe after we're done talking, and uh, Mark as well asked uh, Jacques to comment on his groundbreaking research and some of the things that he's accomplished, even during the slowdown initially of the COVID pandemic. But back to Bob's point, for all of you, please continue to work on your cancer screenings, the preventive health measures that you've done for ages. As Bob well put it, please don't let this pandemic affect you for years to come by the fact of not participating in your health screenings, your cancer screening. There's data and experience that we have throughout the state that we know that if we don't keep up on those things, the number of people getting that cancer or unfortunately dying from that cancer will go up in about five to seven years. So. As Bob has well put it, please uh, continue to strive for that as best you can. Clearly, we think going to your local clinics, your local hospitals, is clearly as safe as going to the grocery store, all which are very important. Okay, thanks. Um, question for you, Jacques. Uh, a request, could you tell a little bit more about the breaking news uh, that you mentioned, about the specifics of uh, uh, what that's about? Uh, certainly, Dean Gold, happy to do so. Uh, so if you have throat cancer, head and neck cancer, you can be cured. Offense radiation, chemotherapy, surgery. But a devastating complication that arises from having had radiation to your face is it, the radiation sort of zaps out your salivary glands and you wind up with really, really, really bad dry mouth. It's, it's, and there's no treatment. So a wonderful collaborator of mine in human oncology, Randy Kimball, radiation oncologist, and he and I teamed up and said, what's the technology out there that we could use to rescue salivary gland function in these patients are otherwise cured? So we basically developed a method. We've published this before, taking some cells from your bone marrow and engineering them in a Petri dish in a way that has never been given to human beings before. And we take those cells and we will inject them in the salivary glands, the purpose of which is to restore function for the salivary gland. And that's the, this will be the first such study in the US and the first time in the world somebody uses a cell therapy of this type and during COVID, people came in evenings and weekends to do because the FDA was open for business. So, so are we. And we move on. And that would that is the license we just got Friday last week. And uh, as soon as uh, we can operationalize it in the cancer center, we're going to be um, enrolling patients. And there's a huge lineup of people suffering with this. So it'll be a big boon for the head and neck cancer patients. It's investigational. I'll make sure it's safe and hopefully it's effective. That's, but we'll, we'll start here. Thanks, Jacques. Uh, here's a question for uh, um, either or both of our uh, medical oncologists. Um, people know folks who have survived the cancer and then they come down with a different cancer and get treated for that and then years later develop yet a different type. Uh, what do we know about that? Are there research projects going on or any insights that can be shared on uh, why some people seem to be 
at risk for more than one cancer in their lifetime? Well, I can speak to that. One of the most well understood reasons is there are certain genes that predispose people to cancer. The most commonly or well, widely known are the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. Um, and those can confer risk of multiple types of cancer. But there are about uh, there are uh, many other genes that are knows, known to confer risk. And what you get into the problem with uh, when you analyze these is there's genes with what's called high penetrance, which means if you have them, you have a very high chance of getting cancer. With BRCA1, you might have an 80% lifetime risk of uh, breast cancer and a 50% risk of ovarian cancer if you're a woman. Uh, whereas other genes we are now discovering, they confer us only an incremental risk. And these genes are much higher or more difficult to uncover because you have to search many more people. And uh, Dr. Mine, uh, who's here in the Center for uh, Human Genomics and Precision Medicine, a new center created in SMPH, is very interested in developing a program which is called a polygenic risk score program, which can survey all the genes across the genome in a very general way and find those that may add up a small contribution here, a small contribution there to, uh, to confer a relatively high risk without having something like a BRCA1. And that may be a very powerful way to identify people who need enhanced screening or vigilance. So that's one example of uh, what we're what we're doing to uncover that. Thanks. Uh, here's a question for uh, for Howard, for Mark, maybe also for uh, for you, Jacques. Um, how can people learn more about participating in clinical trials, uh, cancer trials, but also uh, Jacques for some of the groundbreaking work uh, you're doing, especially people who live in and maybe receive their care in a more rural area of the state, uh, how can they find out if there is a clinical trial that might be appropriate for them? Uh, no. I'll, I'll speak very, very narrowly about the studies where you need an investigational new drug license for an investigational drug. And uh, Howard can uh, ex extrapolate afterwards. But there's a website, clinical trials, plural, all in one word, dot gov. And by statute, as soon as you have one of these federal licenses, you have to post on that website within uh, 30 days of getting the license so that anybody in the US, either from Nevada or from Rhinelander, can look it up. And if they're interested, they can call up to see if they can uh, participate. But uh, so that's the go to web uh, place. But uh, Howard, cancer in general, cancer trials? Yeah, thank you, Jacques. Um, yeah, so for all of you out there with, with interest in cancer clinical trials, and obviously those of you who either are personally or family members suffering with cancer, um, please feel free to reach out to the Carbone Cancer Center at any level, whether it's by email, website, phone. We literally have. Uh, trained staff who will work with you on helping you find cancer clinical trials, not just at our institution here at the University of Wisconsin, but at any place in the country to help you with that. So there's multiple ways to do it. Uh, the various websites, whether for the Cancer Center, uh, UW Health, School of Medicine and Public Health, all are places that you can go for that. Or uh, just uh, typing out any one of our names and, and we'll try and help you out as best we can with that that's an important aspect of us advancing and curing more people with cancer, which is the simple fact that we've got to get better. And the only way we're going to get better is through that applied clinical cancer research that you've been hearing about tonight. And we'd love and want to describe more of it for any of you who are interested. So thank you. Uh, here, here's an interesting question. Um, as demonstrated by the way we're all together here, uh, COVID has uh, introduced us to the world of WebEx and Zoom and a bunch of other ways to spend even more time than we were before in front of the screen. Along with that is telehealth. Uh, a lot of folks uh, have been uh, using telehealth, including uh, doctors in areas that uh, really engage 
telehealth before. When it comes to cancer care, um, once COVID um, is stabilized, however long it takes or whatever stabilization uh, means, down the road as the role of telehealth in cancer care. Uh, are there ways in which telehealth can be used uh, like the success of the uh, molecular tumor board to expand access to specialized services, to expand access to consultations uh, in other areas of the state? What do people see down the road in you know a couple of years of the role of uh, telehealth for cancer care and cancer screening? So the pandemic in many ways, as people have realized, is changing what goes on in our world. Um, and it's likely going to continue to change things. And when it comes to healthcare, it is the incorporation of more remote or video assisted or computer assisted uh, telehealth as the questioner asked. So we are certainly doing more of that and people around the globe are doing more of that. An advantage certainly has been when patients call, whether it's uh, Jacques or Mark or myself or any of the various uh, physician researchers at the university, uh, rather than telling them they got to come and see us, whether they're in Norway or South America or wherever they might be or other states in the U.S., obviously that's a long trip. Now via telehealth, it has made it easier for us to work with patients far and wide and to describe and go over our clinical expertise along with our research expertise with them. So it's clearly changing how we do things, but we'd also stress that there's also the value in the face-to-face. The -face. Clearly when it's deciding what treatments, difficult decisions that have to be made, there's much we can do remotely, but there's also a time and a place for really seeing the person, examining them and really going over things in great detail. So I think going forward, what you'll see is kind of a combination of those things, even long after the pandemic. We will get more efficient with the use of telehealth, but we want to keep uh, some of the other things that are important to the best care for patients. And telehealth has in, in enabled us to actually do more consultations with researchers and providers around the globe. So the systems have been in place that are now much easier for us, just like they for, are for you as the, the public or as patients. So we're all going to benefit at least from that aspect of this. Thanks, Howard. Uh, we've got actually two questions for Melissa. Uh, Melissa, you have a very special uh, position in the university with, um, you know, one foot right in the campus at the uh, Mortgage Research Institute and the other in the Carbone Cancer Center in the uh, uh, health uh, complex. So uh, a couple of questions. One, uh, in addition to the wonderful collaborations that you and others have with uh, the Carbone Cancer Center, can you Talk a little bit about other scientific collaborations uh, across the School of Medicine and Public Health and across the campus that make the Mortgage Research Institute so special. And then the second part is this. While the School of Medicine and Public Health, before COVID, during COVID, after COVID, we work 12 months out of the year. For other parts of the campus, especially undergraduates, um, there's a, a kind of annual rhythm and we are all nervously seeing what's happening at other colleges around the country. As we anticipate the return of undergraduates, as we anticipate graduate students uh, playing a role in undergraduate education, as well as in the multidisciplinary research that your group does, what are your thoughts about what we can expect uh, in, in the next uh, several weeks and several months <laughs> of the uh, rest of campus and how that might impact uh, your, your research uh, team's work and, and other things. So there's a lot there to unpack, but in the remaining um, nanoseconds that we have, can you expound on, on those big questions? Yes, happy to. So the, as you said, the Mortgage Institute for Research is right in the middle of central campus and we have many basic scientists there. So we have a virology group, which is of course very busy right now. Um, we have metabolism group, which I'm part of, and we have an engineering group, which I'm part of. So the uh, metabolism group is working closely with the medical center on understanding metabolic pathways that contribute to inflammation. So Jing Fan is actually doing some fantastic work on macrophages, which are specific immune cells involved in wound healing, but also in cancer. 
um, our virology uh, group is working on actually things that will um, interact with viruses across different types so the very basic mechanisms of virus interaction with cells and they're hoping to have this uh, vaccine you know that would work against many different type types of viruses um, the engineering group actually is super fun of course you know engineers um, and we have a fab lab which i think has been really great for the undergraduate experience especially in engineering because you can rapidly build prototypes so you can go in there with a drawing or with a plan and you can make something actually um, that's useful for the hospital. So, you know, in my interactions with undergraduates, I work on design teams. So what we do is we actually get um, problems from physicians like Mark or Dusty and they say, I need this little widget. Can you help me? And the students have to come up with a solution. And they do that by interacting with our fab lab, by designing and failing a lot. I think failure is an important part of the undergraduate experience. It makes us ready for the real world, which is a lot of failure. Um, so I think, you know, it, with the campus reopening, we actually really miss our undergraduates. They're an important part of our lab and our experience. And um, I'm hopeful that we can get them in in some capacity in the lab, hopefully in the next academic year. I don't know how soon. Great, thank you. Uh, one last question for Howard, and uh, it's going to be like a, a speed question with a speed response. What makes you the most excited and the most optimistic about cancer research leading to cancer treatment in the future? Thank you, Bob. Uh, what makes us the most excited and optimistic and the, the fact that we're gonna to continue to make great progress against cancer are the three cancer researchers you just heard from. They are wonderful examples of both just incredible intellect, incredible compassion, incredible commitment to using the great UW research, the great care at Wisconsin Medicine, and all of that combined through the Carbone Cancer Center to really advance what we're doing. So we are very optimistic about it. Cancer obviously affects far too many of us and still does, but we are gonna persevere and continue to battle. And the three great researchers you heard from are just great examples of it. Well, I really want to thank all of our panelists. I especially want to thank all of you who have listened in and sent us wonderful questions. I hope you enjoy this evening as much as I've enjoyed uh, this evening. Um, you know, this is the inaugural launch of this new series. I hope you will come back to the programs um, through September. Our topics will include women's health, Alzheimer's disease, and the future of patient care from a multidisciplinary approach. We are delighted to share with you Wisconsin Medicine's leading efforts to solve the most challenging and important questions um, in health and health care. So again, thank you so much for joining us. I look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care and on Wisconsin.